Hi, I'm Sydney. Um, and as Mary said, um, I'm, I'm going to be presenting on the Human Centered Design course thread. And the title of my presentation is An Interdisciplinary Approach to Innovation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of the three courses I took to complete the course thread. But I'd also like to tie in my experience with Berkeley Innovation and the decal that they run. Um, and Berkeley Innovation is a human-centered design club on campus that I know some other presenters are also involved with, so you'll probably hear more about it today. Um, and I'll also um, talk a little bit about how I've been applying human-centered design um, outside of school. Um, and I also hope to answer the question, um, what is the value of interdisciplinary perspectives in design? So the three courses I took were Introduction to Cognitive Science, um, over two years ago, uh, Computational Models of Cognition, and uh, a course in the School of Information called Theory and Practice of Tangible User Interfaces. But before I begin, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what human-centered design is, because I know when I talk to my family and friends um, and mention the phrase, um, I'm often met with a lot of confusion or like, um, pretending to understand. And I get that because I didn't know what human-centered design was um, less than a year ago. Um, so basically, human-centered design is about understanding the needs of users and or, or really understanding the needs so you can design the best possible solutions for them. And it's also an iterative process. So you're constantly researching, talking to people, um, generating ideas prototyping, testing solutions, and like always reflecting back on what the user's needs are. Um, so you can make sure that your solutions are in, a, in line with them. Um, it's very easy to become biased by your own background. So um, this process, so this is basically the human-centered design process. So. The first course I took was in summer 2011, and it was Introduction to Cognitive Science. Um, this was my first introduction to the field, and I learned what cognitive science was, which is the interdisciplinary approach to studying the mind. Um, it draws from, from research in multiple fields, including psychology, philosophy, linguistics, computer science, neuroscience, and various social science fields. Um, this is what first got me thinking about declaring my major, um, just because I was really um, excited about the breadth of the major. Um, even though in summer 2011, I had no idea what human-centered design was, um, since then, I've noticed a lot of similarities between human-centered design and cognitive science. For instance, cognitive science is about understanding the human mind through multiple disciplines. And human-centered design is about understanding human needs to solve problems, often through the use of multidisciplinary teams. All right, so last spring, I was fortunate enough to decide to take the design decal um, run by Berkeley Innovation. And if I hadn't done that, I probably wouldn't be presenting today, because I wouldn't really know what human-centered design was. <laughs> um, but um, this, this course was an overview of the human-centered, or taught you about the human-centered design process and let you apply it through small, fun projects. Um, for example, our first project was redesigning the instant noodle ramen experience and improving it to, like, improving it for college students who, like, maybe don't have a lot of time to cook or eat healthy foods. So that was fun. And then um, towards the end of the course, I worked with another student and we did some user research and, oh, um, and actually designed a prototype of a site that searches for cognitive science courses that are offered during a given semester. Um, anyway, I finished the decal and it got me really excited about human-centered design and, um, and I decided to join Berkeley Innovation for my last semester. Um, Berkeley Innovation is made up of 
a bunch of student designers, um, all from different backgrounds um, and majors. And you get to work together in small groups on um, design projects throughout the semester. Um, you also get to do fun field trips to places like Autodesk, where we got to see a lot of design exhibits. Um, and this semester, I've been working with a few other students um, on designing a prototype for the new museum in Santa Cruz. Um, it's, an, it's an exhibit about mushrooms. <laughs> and it's been really interesting, because it doesn't really seem like your typical design um, project, but we've, we've been doing a lot of user research oops, sorry, um, at like museums, like the, the Habitat Museum for Toddlers on Shattuck, um, to see how kids interact with uh, exhibits, and then we're actually building a small prototype of what we hope the exhibit to, what we envision the exhibit to look like, and that's what that little tree is on the right. Uh, we are actually going to work on it more today. So, um. <laughs> all right. So that same semester that I got, uh, that I took the decal, I also took computational models of cognition with Tom Griffiths. Um, this course was all about uh, formalizing human behavior and uh, about different approaches to modeling cognition. Um, the goals were to explain human cognition in terms of computation, but also to gain insight about how to solve computational problems based on our understanding of human behavior. Um, so like we, we studied three approaches, but I'm not gonna go into those in too much detail. Um, but I did learn something from studying these approaches and that's that human cognition is really hard to formalize um, because humans, the, the way humans categorize things, there's like fuzzy boundaries, like what makes a dog a dog, or, um, like, and with neural networks, which um, which it, which show how humans learn or model how humans learn. Sometimes they learn things that humans don't learn and. There's also the problem of um, how can you make machines explain human irrationality? Um, so, so the more I thought about this, the more I, the more I realized like we really need to be able to understand human cognition in order to model it well. And to, to do so, it's really useful to draw on a lot of um, research from these various fields in cognitive science. All right, so the course I'm finishing up this semester is uh, Theory and Practice of Tangible User Interfaces with Kimiko Ryokai. Um, and this, the field of t TUIs or TUIs um, is really interesting. Um, it really encourages new ways for people to interact with technology um, rather than just like clicking on your mouse and seeing some sort of visualization on your computer. Um, it encourages you to explore more sort of embodied um, technologies. Um, for example, um, well, for one of our assignments a couple weeks ago, we had to design a musical instrument. And the instructions were really open-ended. Um, Kimiko just said that we needed to, to make an instrument with at least four different types of input devices. So all of our assignments were kind of like this, really, really broad, but they encouraged us to be creative in our designs. And um, through taking this course, I realized that um, there are just so many possible solutions out there if you, if you're, if you can think creatively and work with other people. Um, there are so many possibilities. All right, so, so to learn more about design, because I discovered this field pretty late um, compared to a lot of my peers, uh, I decided to join, or to get together with some of my friends and form like a design team outside of school. So we, we've been using IDEO's human-centered design toolkit and some other toolkits, um, and um, and using the human-centered design process to try to 
tackle like more problems in the Bay Area. Um, these aren't exactly, uh, this isn't product design or like user interface design. We're using the process towards more sort of social problems. Um, and this is just showing that IDEO recommends multidisciplinary teams too. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, we've, we've just been applying the process towards um, issues like improving or improving access to healthy foods in the Bay Area, um, just to get more familiar with the design process and see how it can be used um, for all sorts of different problems. All right, so to conclude, what I really learned while doing this course thread was that different perspectives are beneficial for coming up with creative solutions and for understanding human needs and behaviors. And I also learned from people in Berkeley Innovation and from, from doing extracurricular design projects um, is that human-centered design is really all around us. Thank you. Oh yeah. How are you doing that? And what the human centered design toolkit actually is. Okay, yeah, sorry, that was kind of brief. Um, but so we talked about a lot of different issues like um, income inequality and like all sorts of huge issues that like I didn't really think you could apply design towards, but um, IDEO actually has this toolkit that's meant for like NGOs and more like um, small businesses uh, that they can use. And it's like a set of guidelines uh, for solving, for, for using design skills towards like more, more social issues. But we've just been talking about doing a lot of research about like where food deserts are, like what organizations are already like doing to help solve the problem. And right now we're trying to find people we can contact and interview and do qualitative research for. But you can download the Human Center Design Toolkit for free. And there are other design toolkits out there too. Yeah. Oh yeah, um, well, we didn't actually improve the product itself, we just kind of like, <laughs> like designed what we thought would be better. But we, we incorporated a different type of biodegradable styrofoam into the bowl, so yeah. So, and we also reduced the sodium and included chopsticks with it, so you didn't even have to have your own like utensil. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, <laughs> my name is Nghi, and as Mary said, I'm a senior, graduating senior in cognitive science, and I will be presenting on human-centered design, which I just discovered this semester, actually, from talking to Sydney. So, <laughs> yeah, a lot of this is going to be overview of my courses and not more like practical um, projects, but I really like it. So first, I'm going to go over human-centered design as defined by IDEO, which is a design and consulting firm which helps different businesses um, improve their solutions using this HCD process. And rather than thinking of it as a step-by-step -step process, it's more of an overlap between um, the de desirability of design, whether or not it's viable as a business, business solution, and whether or not the technology we have at the time is feasible for this solution. And somewhere in the middle, we have an innovative solution. So I've been reading this book called The Design of Everyday Things by Donald Norman. And a way to illustrate what the, um, what you got? HCD um, is in contrast to is the previous design aspects of process which designed the modern day office phone. 
And if you've used the Office Phone nowadays, you'll know that so many features of it, it just doesn't really make sense. So I used to work for Residential Computing, which is an organization on campus that helps um, students in the dorms um, with their internet problems. And each year in the beginning, we had, to, um, we had to train them on how to work the help desk. And not just customer service, but the actual phone. So at the top here, we have a sticker posted by my boss to remind us how to turn on the phone. At the, you turn on the phone at the beginning of the business day, like at 9 a.m. So you enter 12, um, 12 pound, and then at the end of the business hour at 5 p.m., we enter a series of numbers that don't really make sense at all. Mm -hmm. And sometimes um, I'll come in and somebody will say, oh, we didn't have any calls in the morning, and it was actually because they didn't turn on the phone. <laughs> so HCD is in contrast to this and a way better way <laughs> to design um, taking upon like features that are transferable like, and not just like random numbers for to activate certain features. So um, my journey in cognitive science began in Cux I one, and you saw this graphic from Sydney's pr presentation, uh, basically an interdisciplinary approach, and including six different disciplines. Before I took Cox, I hadn't taken any of these, and I just grew to love each component. Um, I was in Linguistics 100 when my pr professor remarked that there's so many Cox I majors in, in, this, um, in this course, and she once wanted to be a Cox I major, but um, there's just so many different disciplines that you have to be a specialist in that it's so difficult. <laughs> But that's why I love it, because there's so many different perspectives that contribute to the overall um, understanding of the mind. And two fundamental theories that try to answer the question of where does knowledge come from are these two classic examples, empiricism and rationalism. So empiricism is basically the idea that we all start off with a blank slate. It's like the, 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 nature, the nurture argument of the nature versus nurture. And over time, our experiences add up and are associated with one another versus Plato who thought, well, there are certain um, universal truths that we kind of gradually remember as we grow up. And what I had to say about this is that there's so many different um, guest speakers that come in to COXI-1. One of them was a professor from our developmental psychology um, major. And she came up with the theory theory, which is a combination of the two. <laughs> so basically, um, you look at children to try to understand this question. And it's similar to human-centered this human-centered design because you're looking at people and thinking, okay, <laughs> I'm not going to make a bunch of assumptions of what um, people need. I'm actually looking at people to see if they have the answers to my questions. So um, what children do is through experimentation, they, could, they constantly revise their hypotheses, hypotheses about the world to um, better understand it. So then this past summer, I took COXI 101, which is language and the mind. And the big takeaway from that is that language shapes thought. And one mechanism that language shapes thought is through metaphors. <laughs> we heard a lot about metaphors. Um, the primary metaphor is something that is universal, that's transferable cross uh, cultural. Um, and one thing is that affection is warmth. If you say that somebody is warm versus somebody that's kind of detached is cold, you're employing a um, primary metaphor. And we use it so much in our thought, in, in thinking, that we're just kind of unconscious about the way that it affects us. Um, another way is, another metaphor is that time is motion. So usually when people are talking about things in the future, they just articulate to the right versus like talking about the past and they say it's to the left. Um, from this primary metaphor, we have complex metaphors. So if you view, if we view time 
is a resource, then you can say, oh, if you're wasting time, then you're wasting money. So not, um, not all cultures feel that time is a resource. <laughs> so then we have this um, disparity between how Westerners think that, okay, we're always rushing to do things versus other cultures, which may be a little bit more lax. So in employing metaphors in design, we have this uh, archaic, um, this example of the desktop. This is a desktop in a desktop. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so things are made simple for us because there are certain things we can recognize without having to read a really, really long instruction manual. We can just say, okay, this is the trash. I'm gonna put this in the trash. And these are folders. I'm gonna put my files into folders. And lastly, I've been taking CS188, which is artificial intelligence. And I learned that humans are not optimal. We're kind of irrational. <laughs> but everything that we build in CS is geared towards being the most efficient and optimal solution to whatever problem that we have. But even though we're irrational, um, trying to simulate how simple human processes are is very beneficial to advancing technology such as trying to uh, simulate vision or in trying to create something that is voice recognition. So it's still a process, and if you ever talk to Siri, you know that this is still a process that's still being improved over time. Um, yeah, and, and um, currently my last project is about um, image recognition, so in, trying to imitate like human visual systems, you also employ another, another tactic um, that is similar to what humans do, is just have, we have neural networks. So from neural networks, we have artificial neural networks. So overall, we tried to simulate how humans um, process things, and even though we're not optimal, we have, um, there's a lot of benefits from trying to simulate how we work. So how does HDD and cognitive science relate? Well, it's, uh, cognitive science is a combination of disciplines that come together to give us a better comprehension of the human mind. So it's not just linguistics or anthropology or neuroscience, it's all these things working together to give, her, give us a better perspective. And similarly, HDD is not just a series of steps, but it's an overlap of three, three key components. And the, to answer the question of whether knowledge is, where is knowledge from? Well, it's not just empiricism or rationalism. Um, the innovative solutions to these questions lie somewhere in the cross. And more human feedback gives us better insight on what these possible solutions may be without leaving things out. Thanks for listening. Just to jump right in, uh, the courses I took for this course thread were Bioethics and Society, Environmental Policy Administration and Law, and the History of Science in the US. And I've used components from all three of these uh, for my presentation today. Uh, bioethics really taught me about the assumptions that we have about the validity of science and uh, how to challenge these assumptions. Um, this can be seen in my discussion about the experts and the label of science. Uh, policy taught me about the institutions and policy-making processes for science, which can be seen in my discussion of the courts and of policy-making institutions. And history of science really showed me examples of these and taught me themes surrounding science that extend throughout history, um, which can be seen in my notes about the surrounding historical and social events and themes that surround the rise and fall of the eugenics movement. A brief background about the Eugenics Records Office. Uh, so the Eugenics Records Office was founded by Professor and Geneticist Charles Davenport uh, at Cold Spring Harbor, Long Island, New York in 1910. Davenport was fascinated with the idea of genetic betterment of populations as a cure for social ills. Uh, at his urging, his one-time student, Harry Laughlin, became the superintendent of the Eugenics Records Office in 1913. 
Laughlin was not a noted scientist, but he was a really great campaigner and lobbyist for the eugenic cause. While the ERO was not the only eugenics organization in existence during the early 20th century, it was by far the most prominent. It was the only one with a paid staff and research facilities. It was funded largely by grants from the Carnegie Institute of Washington and by Mrs. E. H. Harriman, who was the widow of a wealthy railroad magnate. The ERO's association with Cold Spring Harbor, the station for the experimental study of evolution, and noted scientists like Charles Davenport and Alexander Graham Bell, who was on the board of directors, if you'll remember, he invented telephone, uh, really granted an, an era of uh, scientific authority. And the ERO became one of the most uh, well-known and consulted eugenics organizations of the early 20th century. So the question I'll be answering is, what techniques did the eugenics records office use to influence government policymaking in eugenics? And my thesis is that it attempted to influence government policymaking in two main ways. Uh, the first is through conducting and publishing strategic research reports and bulletins advocating for its eugenic political position. And the second is by deploying Harry Laughlin to foster relationships with important figures in government to lobby members of Congress and to testify before government hearings as an expert eugenical agent. So in order to influence government policymaking, the ERO needed to establish two ideas. One, that eugenics was a legitimate scientific field of study with tremendous possibility of improving society. And two, that the ERO was the most knowledgeable and authoritative voice to address such, such matters. In order to do this, the ERO published frequent reports and near quarterly bulletins about its goals, activities, research, and political stances. These reports and bulletins attempted to garner financial and political support for the ERO by illustrating the science behind its eugenic message. These reports were authored by various doctors, PhDs, MDs, to throw the full weight of the ERO's experts and their associated authority behind its broader mission of political influence and policymaking. And these reports helped the ERO market its ideas as the natural consequence of intellectual and scientific progress. The ERO's first report was authored by its superintendent, Harry Laughlin, and published in June 1913. Uh, it was entitled The Eugenics Record Office at the End of 27 Months' Work. In this report, Laughlin offered a brief history of the Eugenics Record Office and set forth an overview of the mission of the office. Uh, he described the ERO as a natural outgrowth of the human heredity studies of Dr. Charles V. Davenport, and he again invoked the name of science when defining eugenics. Uh, eugenics is that science which studies the factors of race betterment. In other words, eugenics studies the very real, very possible, and highly scientific concepts that race exists, that there are superior and inferior races, and that races, or at least the racial composition of a population, can somehow be improved. Uh, Laughlin followed that with describing the nine purposes of the ERO. Um, the first was to serve as a repository and clearinghouse for eugenic research and research practices. Um, in order to do this, it would advise researchers, it would provide charts, uh, lists of specific characteristics, um, tools to standardize research. Uh, it would also train and supply field workers. To further standardize research, the ERO would create an analytical index of the traits of American families for the purposes of research. Um, this index called the trait book would be quote, based upon an expansible decibel system, end quote, that would attach numeric values to certain traits. For example, the number 4598 would stand for ability at chess playing. This attempt at classification of hereditary fitness would certainly add to the appearance of scientific legitimacy of eugenics. Laughlin called the index, quote, an endless task, but such an index is needed by the American people as a measure of the quality of its human stock, it is one of the prerequisite essentials to any far-reaching plan for cutting off the supply of defectives and for securing fit matings among the better classes. Uh, other goals were to do original research on heredity and eugenics and to publish this research to disseminate, quote, eugenical truths, end quote. Um, you can see some examples listed here. These reports use family trait histories, pedigrees, and charts to demonstrate the inheritance of all manner of traits and to encourage policymakers to pass legislation to encourage reproduction among those believed to possess positive traits 
and discourage or even prevent reproduction among those considered to have negative traits. For example, um, Davenport's The Feebly Inhibited One, Violent Temperance Inheritance, examined the history of 165 wayward girls in state institutions to determine to what extent emotional traits that led to criminality were hereditary. Um, they made ample use of field workers to interview the girls and their families. Um, and Davenport wrote that there was a correlation between epilepsy and outbursts of bad temper. Uh, he described a composite typology of the girls' perceived violent and insane behavior. Uh, quote, patient shows, especially at the menstrual period, an excited attack preceded by about two days of increasing restlessness. At the crisis, patient sings, swears, bangs about movables, threatens to take her own life and that of others. The acute attack lasts for a day or two and is followed by a period of depression and inactivity for a day or two, after which the patient's reactions return to normal level, end quote. Uh, Davenport was sure to point out that these fits of temper were, uh, quote, often associated with the menstrual period, end quote, and that, quote, monkeys show this type of temper, end quote. Davenport went on to discuss how violent temper can be inherited, concluding that the results show that it must be dominant, must not be sex-linked, and must be due to, quote, a simple, single, positive determiner. Uh, these reports helped influence the tenor of public and government thinking about eugenics and eugenic policies such as sterilization laws, in particular, supposedly scientific and certainly sexist depictions of violent, irrational, sexually charged, and depressive women who lacked control over their tempers during their menstrual periods but built support for sterilization laws for women considered unfit both to rear children and to pass on their genes. Uh, some other examples, the Yarrow began publishing the Eugenical News in 1916. This was a layperson's journal uh, filled with short popular ar articles um, extolling the ERO's latest research. Uh, it was a highly propagandic um, a journal. And another example, Laughlin wrote a 1,300-page study about eugenic sterilization, in which he advocated strongly for sterilization laws that would allow the involuntary sterilization of people in public institutions. Uh, neither the Carnegie Institute of Washington nor the Rockefeller Foundation wanted to pay to publish such a controversial study. Uh, so Laughlin uses connections with a judge to secure funding. Laughlin published and gathered information on legal developments and developments in sterilization legis legislation. Uh, these were used as guides by legislators trying to learn more about legislation eugenics. Uh, he became the primary consultant to the Municipal Court of Chicago on the subject of alien crime uh, and cultivated a close friendship with Harry Olson, the judge who helped him secure the funding for his 1,300-page manuscript. Uh, but his most influential role is as the expert eugenics agent for the House Committee on Immigration and Naturalization, uh, a position that he was awarded by his friend, the committee's chairman, Albert Johnson. Uh, Laughlin, testified, uh, Laughlin testified that it was possible to stimulate Northwestern Europeans into American society, but it was much more difficult to stimulate other Europeans and practically impossible to stimulate, quote, any of the colored races, end quote. He claimed that earlier waves of immigrants from Northwestern Europe were industrious, courageous, intelligent, and came to the US in search of better opportunities. However, later waves of immigrants from Southwestern Europe and Asia were forced out of their own countries and were merely looking for a safe place to exist, not a place where they could thrive. Uh, Laughlin called these immigrants uh, typically feeble-minded and criminal. He used statistical analyses to show that there were higher populations of southern and eastern European immigrants in federal institutions like prisons and asylums than there were native whites. Sorry. <laughs> uh, as such, these immigrants of deficient stock should be kept out of the United States for the biological good of the country. So why were Laughlin's ideas so well received in Congress? Uh, since many of these southern and eastern European immigrants became labor organizers, promoted communist or socialist ideologies and practiced Catholicism, many members of Congress, fearful of challenges to the Protestant, capitalist, and pro-business order, were eager to hear and support his ideas. His ideas essentially provided a scientific foundation on which Congress could place its existing biases. In fact, the committee uh, didn't even commission any other reports during its immigration hearings. Uh, a transcript of its 
of Laughlin's testimony was published in the congressional record and it was instrumental in the passage of the Immigration Restriction Act in 1924. Laughlin was once more called to testify as an expert before the Supreme Court in the 1927 case of Buck v. Bell. Uh, brief overview of the Buck v. Bell case, it was a case to establish the legality of forced sterilization in Virginia. And it was centered around Carrie Buck, uh, a young ward of the state who was uh, believed to be feeble-minded and had given birth to a child out of wedlock. Uh, the, the Virginia law that was used to uh, justify the sterilization was based on uh, Laughlin's model sterilization law. Uh, Laughlin was asked to perform a detailed analysis of Buck's family history, and although he never examined her and never received much information about Buck's uh, family history, schooling, or mental, mental and physical health, he nonetheless declared her a, uh, quote, low-grade moron, and said that her child Vivian, quote, supposed to be a mental defective. Laughlin condemned Buck as a, quote, potential parent of socially inadequate offspring, and, quote, something he said he was able to test to its scientific conclusiveness. The Supreme Court ruled 8 to 1 to uphold Virginia's right to forced steril sterilization. Uh, Laughlin's expert testimony helped the Supreme Court see sterilization as a legitimate demonstration of police power akin to vaccinations and quarantines for the purposes of social protection. Bolstered by this ruling, more state legislators began passing sterilization laws. Uh, and in 1922, 18 states had eugenic sterilization laws, but by 1931, 32 states had these laws. However, in the 1930s, eugenics as a field began to decline in prominence. Respected geneticists like Thomas Hunt Morgan, whom some of you might know with his studies on fruit flies and genetics, increasingly criticized and discredited non-scientific genetics research. With the rise of Nazism and the beginnings of World War II, eugenics increasingly became associated with Nazi racial hygiene. The Carnegie Institute of Washington, which had previously provided funding for the ERO, progressively became reluctant to continue its association with eugenics. Uh, the committee demanded that the ERO stop publishing the eugenical news and, quote, cease from engaging in all forms of propaganda and the urging or sponsoring of programs for social reform or race betterment, such as sterilization, birth control, inculcation of race and, or national consciousness, restriction of immigration, etc., which was certainly an indictment of Laughlin's political activities. The ERO began to rapidly fade away, and its subsequent closure in 1939 signaled the end for the larger eugenics movement albeit certainly not an end to ongoing policies like mass sterilizations and immigration restrictions. Uh, some themes to consider are the importance of learned societies for the dissemination of information and publications and for building interest in a field of science, the role of private and philanthropic funding for science, and the authority of the expert within the, uh, and within the label of science. The ERO's techniques demonstrate that even when science is not sound, the force of the insistence of experts can have tremendous consequences for society. All right. <laughs> Are there any questions for Natalie? I have a question. What was the general reaction of the scientific community around this time? Was there any pushback to the work of the ERO from other scientists? Yeah, there was certainly there was. There was. There were scientists who were more supportive and scientists who were less so. Um, as you can see, I think, oh, right here, those are some of the scientists who supported it, but there was a lot of pushback. Um, I, I believe Herbert, Herbert Spencer Jennings was another scientist who uh, disagreed. Thomas Hunt Morgan, as I mentioned before, was very influential due to his work with fruit flies and, and genetics. So there was certainly um, a lot of disagreement as well. Hi, my name is Joyce, and I am a cognitive science and English major. And my course thread is on human-centered design. And so my title is People First Mostly. So. Um, my overview of the courses that I'm going to present today are Intro to COGSI, COGSI C1, Mind and Language, User Interface Design, and Language and Power. And Language and Power is actually not within the thread, but I thought it was really relevant, so I put it in there anyhow. Um, and then, <laughs> yes, yes. And then, um, 
<laughs> and then other courses that I've taken is um, Art and Science on Reels. It was a freshman seminar. And so I did like an ergonomics project with that. So that was kind of another way I was involved in human-centered design. And then I also took the artificial intelligence class. So yeah, which you guys have heard about earlier. So some extracurricular activities that I'm a part of. Um, I'm a part of Berkeley Innovation, which is the human-centered design club that Alex Insigne and I are all in. And I'm also um, the editor-in-chief of Berkeley Byte, which is this design, culture, and technology news site. And um, this year I also participated in the CMYK Designathon, and Berkeley Innovation recently hosted a Designathon with Stanford. So that's kind of neat. So, um, Fortuitously, my, the courses I'm going to present today also reflect my undergraduate journey. So this is spring freshman year with Professor Terry Regeer, and it was intro to COGSCI. That was probably one of the most eye-opening courses um, that I took that semester. So first, we're going to look at vision as induction. So it, I don't know if you guys can see, but there's an A here and a B. Um, can anyone tell me which one they think is lighter or darker or if they're the same? A is darker. A is darker. Zach? They're the same. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, well, let's see. Okay, so A and B are actually the same, as Zach said. So if we join the squares marked A and B with two vertical stripes of the same shade of gray, it becomes apparent that these two are actually the same shade. And we can go back again um, to look at it. So that's actually how it looks, but then when you put the squares on. And so um, I think that is very pertinent because a lot of the times we acquire knowledges from instances that we've seen before. And so oftentimes we'll generalize beyond whatever we're seeing, but our conclusions could be wrong. And so I think that's really important because designers, if they could go in with assumptions and oftentimes prove themselves wrong and not knowing what exactly the human needs are. So that's the first important part. And um, a view of the mind is that our senses provide us with information of what's true in the world. And then we infer what we think and derive new facts from it. And then those facts allow us to take action. So that's just a general overview. And then we've come to my favorite philosopher from that class. His name is Leibniz. And so, um, no joke, Professor Regeer actually had a slide of the Leibniz cookie and a picture of him. So, but the thing is, he was a very, very influential philosopher, but he also wrote super, super long and convoluted sentences. So um, that's just one thing to know about Leibniz. But he's been very influential, I think, in my own um, career, just in terms of how I think about language, because he believed that people were largely benevolent and cooperative, but because of language that hampered their cooperation, because language is an imperfect mirror of um, our thoughts. And so what he thought of was to have this ideal language called the universal characteristic, which would be like a symbol, like drawing kind of base thing that would represent people's thoughts. Um, but what I got out of that was that design should close this gap. So design should be a way for people to basically be able to express how they, or what they wanna do and be able to do that very effectively. And so another thing that I learned from that class is about latent learning. So in COGS IC1, we're introduced to all these experiments. And so one of the experiments is that there are three groups of rats, and they run through a maze. And so the first group of rats, they were rewarded every time that they succeeded. The second group, they were never rewarded. And the third group, they were unrewarded for the first 10 days, and then they were reported upon success. So they actually learned the map or how to go around navigate the maze more quickly than the other two groups. So basically what latent learning is talking about is that while these rats were traveling through and didn't have the rewards, they actually learned a lot from it. Um, and so the thing is, um, going back to an inductive problem, these mice were kind of little inductors and they just went around and learned all these things. Um, and so we see um, induction in learning rules and concepts in detective work, um, in perception, in learning language, and in making 
scientific discoveries. And so we can see that design is also an inductive problem because you go in with certain assumptions about something, but then you learn from it and iterate upon that to create a solution. And so um, another th thing that we learned in COGSIC1 that has also been super influential is the superior wharf hypothesis, which is basically saying that if you speak a different language, that will cause you to understand the world in a different way. And so what that means is that different cultures may perceive the world differently. Um, and so because of that, there are some implications for human-centered design. So for example, if we're designing for a different culture, we have to take that into account and we have to understand um, the different cultural assumptions that people have. And then um, also, so just to sum up this class, this taught me about creating designs that close the gap between thought and language slash action and to create designs that foster latent learning. So um, Alex actually shared this Google I.O. talk with us. Like we have this very active Facebook group, but basically the designers were talking about how we shouldn't treat humans as stupid people, but we should assume that they know what they want to do. So for example, if you have those pop-up dialogues that are like, are you sure you want to quit this application? They said that instead you should say something like, you're going to quit this application. And if they want to cancel, they can cancel. But it's just interesting uh, to see how people use language differently and how that changes the way that people think about a product. And so mind and language, this is the second class that I took, spring of sophomore year. And so I think everyone's, or most people are going to talk about this class. So metaphor and embodiment. Um, basically metaphor is the mapping between two concepts to help a better understanding, like affection is warmth. And then um, primary metaphors, so they correlate an experience. So it capitalizes a lot on embodiment, which is the sense that like the things that you learn are through physical experiences that you have. So for example, like if you know that affection is warmth, it's because you were held um, as a baby and you felt the warmth of your mother or your father and stuff like that. And that's how you come to understand the world. And so here are some metaphors. Um, like. Theories are buildings where like life is a journey because so like these are something or understanding is grasping. So that comes with like the metaphor ideas are objects like that went way over my head. So that is an example of how the metaphor is used. And classic folder. I thought Alex would probably have a trash can. So I decided <laughs> I decided to choose a folder instead. Um, and then, um, so this is another thing that just came from the Apple Human Interface Guidelines. When virtual objects and actions in an application are metaphors for objects and actions in the real world, users quickly grasp how to use the app. So it's like if we connect things to real life that people already know, it's much easier for them to use. Um, so yes, again, the implications are to create designs that build upon experiences and existing knowledge and to utilize metaphors to foster easy understanding of how to use products. So then, this is now spring of junior year, and this is probably the most design relevant class that I've taken, and it's um, the user interface design and development class with Professor Bjorn Hartman. And so it's an HCI class within the computer science department, but essentially you step through the whole design process and you create multiple um, Android apps, in our case, that semester. And so some of the key concepts were um, to design, prototype, and evaluate. And so I put in research there because although that was not, we did research, but the whole like design cycle that he kept on repeating was design, prototype, and evaluate. But I thought research was really important because that's sort of how you enter the design cycle. And so with research, there's contextual inquiry and task analysis which is basically you go and observe the users and you find out how they use things that they use now. And so say like if it were a ramen problem, I would go and observe people in the dorms and see how they're eating ramen. Um, and then there's also personas. So for example, you can't try to design for everyone, but you can pick extreme users, like someone who eats ramen every single day and then choose them as somebody to design for. And then there's also the idea of affordances and mental representations, which I will now go into. So affordances are basically um, talking about the perceived and actual properties of a thing. So it gives hints about how things could be used. So for example, the scissors 
Example, the holes sort of are affordances that you can put your hand in it. And so that's something that um, designers should be aware of. And then something that was repeated over and over again was the gulfs of execution and valuation. So basically it's talking about how your mental model should be reflected upon what's in the real world. So people have goals on what they want to do and the physical system should reflect that. So here's another diagram that kind of describes that, um, the sequence of actions and the intention to, ask, to act and then how that all sort of fits together. And um, so these are some of the things that I built in that class. I built a tip calculator called Mad Tips, which is a play on Mad Libs. And then <laughs> um, I also built this. We had to build a BART application for people who are new to BART. So it's called the new BART. And so um, it has like just very simple questions like how do I buy and use a ticket? Where can I go? How much will my trip cost? And when will the next train leave? And then so here's. Um, just other screenshots of like, yeah, so if you want to calculate like the one way or the round trip, stuff like that. Um, so again, like conducting user research is very important. Use mental models to inform design and iterate and test often. And so now to language and power, <laughs> my favorite course of this semester. And so it's taught by Professor Claire Cromsch. It's one of the LNS discovery courses. Um, and I could literally talk about this class for a whole 15 minutes, but I'm not going to. And I'm just going to say one thing that we've learned recently that I think really like made me think about how it relates to design is public interest versus interest of the public. So public interest is what is deemed good for the public, and interest of the public is what the public deems as important and what the public wants. So public interest is like what an editor would decide what's relevant to put on the front page, and then interest of the public is like, oh, I want to read like the latest on Miley Cyrus or something. And then so what I got out of that was that although human-centered design is focused on the interest of the public, designers should also act with their own discretion, just in the sense that designers have the power to sort of shape the world and how we interact with technologies. So for example, if I'm designing Facebook, I could like take it and make it so addictive that everyone's on it all the time and not be productive, or I could design a system that allows people to use it very effectively within their own time and be it like an add-on to their life and not something that sucks away their life. So with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> um, and so Berkeley Byte, I just want to show this is like my baby. It's a design culture and tech news site. And so this is like what it looks like now. And we just have different stories about it. And then I think the next slide is a little bit PG-13. Oh wait, no, not yet. <laughs> but um, again, so human-centered design and design thinking can be used to solve different problems. Words are important, and although it's human-centered, designers' point of view and opinion are still important and should be considered. Now to the PG-13 part. Uh, <laughs> design is a lifestyle. So it's literally like, you know, you can apply design thinking to a lot of things in your daily life. and. So we should use that and use it wisely and use design to make better decisions and make products that actually help out the human because that's how we can actually make it human-centered and not be like profit-driven or stuff like that. And so thank you. Um, time for some questions or comments. So my project or my uh, my presentation is titled "Designing for the Mind and Mind." And so what I really want to talk about today is um, how how we perceive the world and how that affects how things are designed. So um, in the late 1970s, a guy named uh, Dieter Dieter Rams um, came up with this list of design heuristics, and this is a list of ten um, ten design heuristics that are Supposed to, supposed to represent what good design is. And so you can see you know, good design is innovative, good design makes a product useful, good design is aesthetic, good design makes a product understandable, good design is unobtrusive, and you can read the rest of them. But it's a list, and you can use that to, um, you can use that to look at products like this, and you can use it to evaluate whether or not they are 
well designed. So who likes, who thinks this one is better designed? Who thinks the far one is better designed? I've never used the Nest one yet. I'm yeah, familiar yeah. with the old school. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so when you end up evaluating these against, um, against the heuristics above, this one, on this one uh, the old kind of traditional thermostat meets about four or five of the heuristics, and the Nest meets about nine, nine to 10 of them. Um, and in particular, one of these heuristics that I think is uh, especially important to cognitive science is good design makes a product understandable. And so I guess the question I kind of want to ask is, how do we understand things? And I think that's a question that is asked in a lot of the cognitive science classes that um, we've taken. And so that's kind of what I want to explore. And so, for instance, if we look at that heuristic here, you can see on this one, this is far less understandable. There's the same gauge of numbers on the top and the bottom, and it's kind of unclear what that really means. I don't know what it means. Whereas with this one, it's very, very clear. In 20 minutes, it gives you a very simple gauge, and it's um, understandable for some other reasons that I'm going to get to um, in, in a minute. And so, yeah, we want to look, look at how, how we understand it. Obviously, how we understand is completely internalized in our minds. Hopefully, they're not that small normally. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the, the three classes that I took are uh, Introduction to Cognitive Science, which Joyce talked about, um, covered pretty well. Bas basic Issues in Cognition, which talked about um, well, basic in issues in cognition and how you know, <laughs> you know, uh, different, different sort of specific um, psychological principles that uh, affect how we perceive the world. And uh, the last was the mind and language, which, which Joyce also <laughs> talked about. So Cogsci C1. Um, I'm not going to talk as much about this one as Joyce did, but um, I guess the, the main thing that I took away from this as it comes to design is it was, it was a very eye-opening class when it comes to um, how important our brains really are. Uh, and, th and that sounds kind of obvious that our, that our brains are important, but studying, studying cognitive science from so many, studying the mind from so many different directions really makes you realize um, how much, how responsible our mind is for the way we perceive the world and the way, and the way we see everything. Um, and so, this is awkward, but... <laughs> um, all right, I'm just gonna skip this because we we already we already saw this one. But I've got another one. I've got another one that you that have, hasn't hopefully been shown yet. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so, who, who's seen this before? Okay, great. And and so um, this is basically hacking your mind to um, to mess with it. Your mind, when you look at when you look at something, your mind is performing all these kind of optimizations to figure out what is going on um, in the world and uh, certain things that we can do to. Um, so, or we can look at certain things and it can really just mess with our minds. And this is really just to show that our mind is responsible for entirely for the way we see the world and it's not necessarily always correct, but um, when we are designing things, you really have to take into account how, how the mind actually works and how our brain actually works. And you have to look at these principles or else you'll never be able to design something that works for people. And so the next class I took was um, Psych 120, Basic Issues in Cognition. And so with this class, I'll go a little bit more into detail about some of the principles that I learned that uh, really affect the way that we can design user interfaces to be effective for people. So one of the, one of the largest things that I learned in this class was that our vision is optimized to see structure. And so there's something called uh, Gestalt Principles that we learned about. And um, these are basically principles of how of perception and show how we, um, you know, help us understand how we perceive. So this is one of my, another one of my favorite optical illusions. And so what it really is, is it's two lines, or two bent lines like this, and then kind of three Pac-Man things. But what you see is you see a triangle, you see another triangle right there. And there's actually 
no lines here to make that triangle, but just because of the way our minds work, we actually, it almost feels like you can see the lines filling that in. And that's called the um, Gestalt Principle of Closure. And so some other, some other common ones, the IBM logo, for instance, um, it's actually not letters at all. They're not connected. It's just a series of bars, but we perceive it as an I, B, and an M. Um, and so some, some examples of how that fits into user interfaces. So for instance, this is the principle of continuity. Even though this, this little piece divides um, this bar into two, we still see it as a singular bar, which we, you know, it kind of sounds dumb that we take it for granted, but um, it's actually pretty wild. Like it looks, it should be two separate bars, and the fact that we understand that it's a continuous bar is pretty cool. Um, the Gestalt principle of common fate, so this is going back to the nest example earlier. So the way a nest works is you twist, the, you twist it to adjust the temperature. And when you twist it, the little bar up there um, twists with you. And, by, and because it moves with your twisting, you understand that they're correlated. And um, that understanding of correlation is called the Gestalt principle of common fate, and um, showing when things move together in, um, in, the, in a similar pattern, it is, uh, you understand that they're the same thing. Which, all of these things, like I said, they, they sound like, well, well, yeah, duh. Um, but it's actually pretty amazing that our minds can do this. And finally, um, the Gestalt principle of proximity. So, well, this is actually multiple Gestalt principles, but um, uh, just by chunking things together, we can, we, our mind automatically groups, groups them together. So the white space between each of the, uh, the search results makes it very, very easy for us to understand that they're, they're separate search results. Um, and so by grouping things together, we can, again, understand that they are related. Another thing is that our memory and attention are extremely limited. So the average human mind can hold about seven things in uh, short-term memory. And so things like credit card numbers can become very, very unwieldy, right? It's, it's very hard to memorize a credit card number. Um, even phone numbers, you know, it's, it's 10 digits if you include the, the area code. But, um, we use something called chunking in design and in cognitive science to help people memorize things better. So rather than a phone number being 10 digits, it's really actually three, um, three chunks, two, two of three digits and one of four digits. And that makes it much, much easier. That, that actual chunking of them makes it much easier to memorize. And the same thing with uh, deb debit cards or credit cards, you can see how the information is chunked into fours. And it makes the information much, much more digestible and easier to memorize. And I, I'm sure uh, you've all filled out, um, you know, you've bought something online with a credit card and some interfaces when you fill it out, it's just you have to type in all 16 digits at once and maybe you're looking back and forth from your credit card. It's, uh, it's, it's frustrating, it's confusing if they're all, but uh, um, other, other interfaces will divide up the chunks into, and um, separate them and it makes it much easier to, to, to fill it out. Another thing is uh, something called flow. So flow is a specific mindset that um, people get in when they're working. And uh, so when you're working very, very hard, you get in a specific mindset and uh, it changes your time perception. It changes, um, some, some people think that time goes by very, very quickly. Some people think that time stops. And um, you kind of zone out the rest of the world. It's a very efficient um, place to work in. Um, and another thing is, is that it's very hard to get back into once, you've, once it's been broken. So it takes a long time of focus. And um, so something that, as designers that we have to be very, very careful of is not trying to interrupt people all the time. Because if people are working, if we're, trying to dis if we're distracting them and giving them notifications all the time, um, it can be very frustrating and make users' lives very, very inefficient. So an example of this is one of my least, I don't know who uses Mac and who's updated to the newest, um, the newest version, but this right here is probably one of my least favorite things ever about Apple. Um, when, now that when they have updates, it pops up, and if you, you can't choose to just not update. You have to make it, um, <laughs> you can either say try another hour, try tonight, or remind me tomorrow, and it interrupts you every single day, and there's no option just to make it go away. This is a rant, by the way, because I'm also just very frustrated with it. Um, 
And it's, it's, off, it's awful design and it distracts me every single day and it pops up and I have to make it go away. It's either sitting on the top, front of my, on top of my screen or I have to like be distracted from what I'm doing and um, make it go away every day and it's terrible. Um, one last thing with uh, memory is uh, using recognition versus recall. So humans are very, very, very good at recognizing things that they're familiar with. Um, and they're very bad at recalling things. Um, our memories just in general aren't very good. And so that's the whole principle behind graphical user interfaces is because when you click buttons, um, you, when you can actually visually perceive something and interact with it, you're, um, you're using recall to understand past experiences and do it. Or, sorry, you're using recognition to see what's going on and um, make decisions based on that. But things like the terminal, for instance, um, is entirely based off of recall. Every single command that you do has to be um, typed from memory. And so it's, it's actually, for people who understand how to use it, it can be more efficient, but for the vast majority of users, you know, this is why we don't control our computers from uh, the terminal generally, is because it's, impo it's impossible for, for most people to efficiently control a computer that way. Um, so the last thing from this, <laughs> My flow is broken. Okay. Um, <laughs> so we, we perceive color faster than shape. So I want to do a quick experiment with you guys. Oop, not going to show it to you. Just kidding. Um, so I'm going to show you something on the screen that I just accidentally flashed. And I'm going to ask you a question about it. And I'm going to time you guys in your response. Okay. Okay. So my question for you is... How, I'm gonna show you a series of uh, letters and numbers of different colors, and I want you to tell me how many of them are red. It doesn't matter what the letter number is, just how many are red. Um, and just shout, shout out the number. So, ready, set, go. Yes. Oops, that was the wrong. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so that was about seven seconds. That's pretty good. So I'm going to ask you one more thing. How many of them are G's? I'm just gonna stop you guys. Uh, it's 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 so it's it's 16. There's actually there's actually less of them than um, just red. But because of the way our minds work, we are able to instantaneously see the red number, the um, the red. Whereas we actually have to explicitly count every single one of the letters. Um, and that's super telling for um, for user interfaces. Obviously, we can use color to make our eyes jump to certain places and our, have our have us um, categorize things and understand things very quickly. So, for instance, Google uses this to help you scan through search results very quickly. Their, their links are blue and then the URL is green below it. And it makes a very recognizable color pattern that we can scan through quickly. Another one is buttons they really want you to click. They, made, they want you to share. So um, they, ma they make it blue so you can look at it faster. Um, the last one, I'm gonna skim over sort of the overview of this class because Joyce, Joyce talked about it pretty thoroughly. So I think you understand, um, meta we use metaphors to understand abstract concepts. And so I'm just gonna go through a few quick examples. So um, one, sorry, uh, great. Okay, I should have turned that off. Um, so one, one, of the, one metaphor that we use commonly is more is up. And you can see that in user interfaces. I just want to give you an example here. Um, the fact that we understand that sliding upwards will increase the volume is actually um, pretty interesting and grounded in our understanding that, uh, yeah, more is higher, which um, is based in a primary conceptual metaphor that Joyce talked about. Um, another common computing metaphor is uh, links. Like, actually all of computing is based in metaphors. So um, I had a whole, in, in my notes for this slide, I have a whole list of examples. But, you know, it makes sense. That links, uh, desktop, uh, this, this one is um, categories are containers. So that's why we actually use a use filing system is because, like, Okay, oh, yeah. yeah, we put things in containers. And the last is uh, skeuomorphism, which is using, um, using the real world, or using, using our understanding of the real world to uh, affect our, um, 
our decisions when we're making or when we're interacting with things online. So, for instance, <coughs> it looks like a real bookcase, um, so that we understand more easily how to interact with it. It is a very debatable issue in design right now. Most people don't like it, but um, we understand better. The idea is that we understand better how to interact with it because it mimics what we have in the real world. So, all right, I'm going to finish up and. Uh, Thank you. Do you guys have any questions? <laughs> well um people argue that it's overkill and very constraining so basically when you use a like a, a visual metaphor like that it's it constrains the users inter or it constrains the designers interactions that they can design to the actual um, object in the physical world so they can't be very creative with it um, and also a point to make is that our understanding of objects in the physical world generally are actually based off of these conceptual metaphors like more is up so it's not really necessary to use scale morphism to make people to like help people understand because you can still use these conceptual metaphors to help them understand without actually having to ground it in the physical world like this. Okay, any questions? Any questions for Alex or for any of the other presenters? Okay, I know everybody's probably chilling, right? I <laughs> <laughs>